morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News. This week's headlines. A priest in the Ukraine says, I'm shocked by my church leaders in Moscow. The sunken Russian warship may have carried Christian relics of the true cross. A blast at a Kabul's boys' school kills six and wounds 20. Islamic State jihadist El Shafi El Sheikh is pronounced guilty. Tensions flare as police enter the Al Aqsa Mosque. The accused Paris attacker apologizes to his victims. Riots in Sweden follow a Quran burning event. Justin Welby says the UK's Rwanda asylum plan is the opposite of the nature of God. Pope Francis warns priests against the idolatry that leads to devil worship. In Nigeria, a seminary student dies while reenacting Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Pastor Tony Spell says prophets should reign over the government. Also in the USA, church membership drops below 50% for the first time in eight decades. And a Christian pastor takes over a flight in midair to sing songs to passengers. I will never forget the moment when I woke up early to go to Mass, only to suddenly hear the shocking sounds of bombing, says Father Nikolai Pluzhnik. The wonderful woman who cooked at our church and her son, who was in a wheelchair, were both killed when an artillery shell hit their apartment. I now know of several other of our parishioners who have died. Like most clergy in the region of northeastern Ukraine where he is from, Father Pluzhnik belonged to the branch of the Russian Orthodox Church, which takes its direction from its religious leadership in Moscow. But now, he says, he has applied to join the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which was finally granted independence from the Russian Orthodox Church in 2019. He says many fellow priests who followed Patriarch Kirill in Moscow are doing the same because of the church leader's stance on the war. When the war started, I was waiting to hear from Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, the father of our church, but first there was no reaction at all, and then there was worse, he says. Patriarch Kirill blessed the Russian army and gave his blessing to the war. It was not just him, but the majority of priests in the Moscow Patriarchate, including some that even have Ukrainian roots. I was in shock. Archpriest of the Russian Orthodox Church's Sevastopol district, Sergei Kaliuta, told Russian state media outlet TASS that in 2020, it was decided that a Christian relic, a piece of the true cross, would be carried on the Moskva, the missile-armed flagship of the Black Sea Fleet. That Russian warship was sunk during the military operations against Ukraine last week. In a Muslim-on-Muslim -Muslim conflict, Two bomb blasts at a boys' school in the Afghan capital, Kabul, have killed at least six people and wounded more than 20, officials say. The blast happened at the Abdul Rahim Shahid High School in the Shia-dominated west of the city. The number of dead and wounded is likely to rise. A nearby tuition centre was also targeted in a grenade attack. There was no immediate claim of responsibility, but Islamic State militants have attacked this area in the past. 
Initial reports suggest Abdul Rahim Shahid pupils and staff may have been targeted by suicide bombers, but Kabul police spokesman Khalid Zadran said improvised explosive devices have had been left outside the school, killing six people. A US federal jury in Virginia has convicted an ex-British jihadist over his involvement with a notorious Islamic State terror cell. El Shafi El Sheikh, 33, was linked to the abduction, torture and beheading of several IS hostages in Syria, including journalists and aid workers. On Thursday, after an 11-day trial, he was found guilty of lethal hostage taking and conspiracy to commit murder. El Sheikh was the highest profile IS fighter to stand trial in the US. Hostages nicknamed the Sudanese born Londoner and two other men, the Beatles, after the rock band because of their UK accents. The group's actions are said to have resulted in the deaths of four American hostages, journalists James Foley and Stephen Sotloff, and aid workers Kayla Muller and Peter Kasig. They are also blamed in the deaths of Japanese journalists Harune Yukawa and Kenji Goto, and British aid workers Alan Henning and David Haynes. David Haynes' brother speaks in this video. David was my little brother. He just had this charisma around him. He was a bubbly person. He drew people in. When David started talking with refugees, he changed. We saw for the first time a sense of purpose. He found his calling. The 13th of September was the night that my family were torn apart. Just a few days beforehand, I had moved most of my family to my home. We had people sleeping on the couch, on air beds, all sorts of places. The 13th of September was a beautiful day. We'd filled it full of family love and laughter and hope. hope. I hope my brother would come home safe. There had been an outcry around the world calling for the release of a humanitarian worker called David Haynes. We had all gone to our beds. I'm sat on the side of my bed undressing and my phone began to ring. It was three minutes past 11 at night. And there was the blackness inside of me. Because I knew it was the call that I'd been dreading since day one. There's my team leader here in London telling me that David was no longer with us. And I gathered my family together. I took my mum's ha hands. and told her her son couldn't be hurt anymore. That was truly the worst night of my life. Following days of stone-throwing riots, the far-right Jewish group, Return to Temple Mount, offered a cash prize to anyone who went into Al-Aqsa Mosque and sacrificed a goat, which is a Jewish religious ritual. The sacrifice didn't happen, but the item went viral and provoked more tension. 
the head of Hamas warned that Al-Aqsa is ours and ours alone. Israeli police entered the mosque compound on Sunday and detained hundreds who were piling up stones. Dozens remained inside the mosque itself. At least 19 people were injured and nine were arrested after smashing the windows of buses bringing Jewish visitors to the site. Tear gas, rubber bullets and stun grenades were used. According to Marwan Bishara, Al Jazeera's senior political analyst, in the face of the total control of Palestinian life by the Israeli occupation, the Palestinians regard the compound as their last stand. See this video. Now then, Palestinian worshippers have been forcibly dispersed from the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Israeli forces say it's in response to Palestinians setting up barricades to prevent Jewish groups from entering. Israeli police have increased their presence in the holy site in occupied East Jerusalem. At least two people have been arrested. Uh, let's cross straight away to Natasha Ghanem, who's in occupied East Jerusalem. So, Natasha, what's the latest? What's happening right now? A short time ago, someone got on the loudspeaker inside the El Aqsa compound and said the Israeli police are, quote, invading and uh, putting out a call for people to come and, quote, defend El Aqsa. Uh, right now, we have about 17 people have been injured. Five of them have been taken to the hospital. Their wounds include rubber bullet wounds and beatings. We know that at least two people have been arrested, according to Israeli police. Uh, this began uh, early this morning, around the time of the dawn prayers, when Israeli police said that they had to go inside the El Aqsa compound because a barricade was formed at the gate that non-Muslims use to access El Aqsa compound. Israeli police, or excuse me, the Israelis have a key and restrict access access. In any event, the Israeli police said that they went in dispersed. And uh, since then, several waves of Jewish groups have been allowed to access the El Aqsa compound, beginning at about 7.30 local. It is a designated visiting hour period uh, for non-Muslims. We have about 15, 20 minutes left of that designated visiting period. During Ramadan, uh, uh, for non-Muslims, the visiting hours are greatly reduced. But as you can imagine, the tension, because the memory of what happened on Friday, when more than 400 people were uh, arrested, more than 150 people injured, is still fresh in the minds of many. So who is inside uh, El Aqsa today? These are uh, a variety of Jewish groups that include Jewish settlers, ultra-nationalist and Zionist groups. They believe that they have the right to pray inside the El Aqsa compound. Right now, all they're allowed to do is wander around the grounds. They are not allowed to uh, pray and they are not allowed to perform any kind of ritual. In uh, uh, recent years, the numbers of these groups have increased. They've become more vocal about their desire to pray inside the El Aqsa compound. That is where a site called the Temple Mount also sits. It is very holy to Jews. Uh, and this morning, we have seen increased numbers uh, from a typical uh, Sunday. That is because it's the Passover holiday. It's converging with Ramadan. So there is heightened demand for access to the compound. We've seen children, uh, boys girls and women and men inside the compound but again in about the next 15 minutes or so uh, their access will end we did see video of buses carrying these Jewish groups severely vandalized outside of the gate to the old city uh, police have arrested two people so far prosecutors say Salah Abdeslam 32 is the only surviving member of the so-called Islamic State cell that targeted Paris, killing 130 people. I wish to express my condolences and offer an apology to all the victims, he told the court. Prosecutors say his suicide belt malfunctioned, but Salah Abdeslam said he had changed his mind. He is facing charges of murder of part of an organized terrorist gang, but is not, in, not accused of killing anyone personally. He began his testimony by pointing out that he himself had killed or injured no one. 
I know that hatred remains. I ask today that you hate me with moderation, Salah told the court in a tearful statement. I ask you to forgive me. He has claimed that he had planned to blow himself up in a crowded bar, but changed his mind after seeing the people whom he was about to kill. Salah faces a life sentence if convicted. He has already been handed a jail sentence by a Belgian court for his part in a shootout in Brussels with police that led to his arrest. See this video by those who survived the horrendous event in Paris. It was the first time I was seeing them uh, on stage um, and it was fun. It was very fun until the five or six uh, song where it all began. We heard, you know, quack, 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 something very weird. Flashes, sparks and the noise of you know, persistence. Uh, going fire. Going fire again. were dropping that had been hit at this stage. There was a couple in, just in front of me and the man definitely dropped. And I believe that maybe what I thought was the drink spilling was his blood. And that's when I tried to jump, but couldn't jump. And I realized that my right leg was stuck. And I, I knew that's because of the people falling. And I tried once and I was just bouncing on that barrier and I, feel, I kept thinking the next one is for you. The guys started firing. I, I don't know if they saw us or if they, they just managed to reload again. And we both dropped because we knew it wasn't safe. They're firing again. How can you think like that, that walking in and shooting people in the back while they're having fun at a concert, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me and I don't think it makes sense to you either, it's just... Forty people have been left injured in Sweden after plans by far-right politician Rasmus Paludans to stage public burnings of the Quran sparked violent protests. More than 40 people have been arrested following several days of unrest that have seen cars and a school set alight and police pelted with stones. Rasmus started on Thursday in John Coping where a priest in a nearby church rang the bells to warn of danger. Later the same day, he did the same thing in Ling Koping, where rioting broke loose and he had to cancel. Exactly the same thing happened on his next stop in Nor Koping, where the rioting was even more intensive. On Friday, he was in Rinkeby, a part of Stockholm, famous for its immigrants, and burned another Quran. They tried to kill police officers. Lethal attacks were directed at us. This was worse than violent riots. Anders Thornberg, the national police chief, told a police conference on Monday. There has been gross violence against life and property. These are not ordinary protesters. The, the injured included 26 police officers and 14 members of the public three of whom were wounded by ricochets when police fired warning shots into a crowd of protesters. We suspect that those involved in the riots have links to criminal gangs, Thornburg said, adding some of those criminal individuals are known to the police. The latest riots broke out on Sunday night in Malmo, Sweden's third largest city, as an angry crowd of mainly young people set fire to car tires debris and garbage cans in the Rosengard district. Protesters threw stones and police responded by firing tear gas into the crowd. 
The UK government's plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda is the opposite of the nature of God, the Archbishop of Canterbury has said. In his Easter sermon, Justin Welby said Christ's resurrection was not the time for subcontracting our responsibilities. Speaking at Canterbury Cathedral on Easter Sunday, Mr. Welby said there were serious ethical questions about sending asylum seekers overseas. See this video. This season is also why there are such serious ethical questions about sending asylum seekers overseas. The details are for politics and politicians. The principle must stand the judgment of God, and it cannot. It cannot carry the weight of resurrection justice. It cannot carry the weight of life conquering death. It cannot carry the weight of the resurrection that was revealed first to the least valued. For as a policy, it privileges the rich and the strong. And it cannot carry the weight of our national responsibility as a country formed by Christian values because subcontracting out our responsibilities, even to a country that seeks to do well, like Rwanda, is the opposite of the nature of God, who himself took responsibility for our failures. Pope Francis told priests to spend time contemplating Jesus, as well as showing him their temptations, or the idols hidden under the folds of our cloak. Often, the Pope said, those idols replace faith in God. This happens, he said, even though we might tell ourselves that we know perfectly well the difference between God and an idol. In practice, we take space away from the Trinity in order to give it to the devil, in a kind of oblique worship. One space of hidden idolatry opens up wherever there is spiritual worldliness, Francis said, referring to a culture that focuses on appearances. Pragmatism is a type of idolatry, the Pope said, one that focuses on statistics, numbers that can depersonalize every discussion and appeal to the majority as a definitive criterion for discernment. People cannot be numbered, Pope Francis said, adding that focusing on numbers doesn't allow people to recognize the value of each individual. Finally, the Pope pointed to the idol of functionalism, which focuses on efficiency. The priest with a functionalist mindset has his own nourishment, which is his ego, he said. In functionalism, we set aside the worship of the Father in the small and great matters of our life and take pleasure in the efficiency of our own programs. Pragmatism and functionalism lead priests to replace hope with empirical results, the Pope said making clergy members focus on vainglory and power instead of their flock and faith. In a tragic incident, a seminary student from Nigeria died while reenacting the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. According to reports, the philosophy student collapsed while playing the role of Simon Peter, a disciple of Christ, during the play Passion of Christ. The incident happened on Good Friday while reenacting a scene where St. Peter cuts off a soldier's ear to protect Jesus. Afterwards, Sule Ambrose, 25, was quickly rushed to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. An eyewitness told a Nigerian news outlet that people assumed Ambrose was joking when he collapsed, thinking it was all part of the drama. Pastor Tony Spell 
of the Life Tabernacle Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, wants to run the government, or at least have the right to veto government policies he doesn't like and command others instead. He has ambitions to be the American equivalent of the Iranian supreme leader or the equivalent of a Taliban caliph. Unelected, accountable to no one but himself, and having the power to meddle in every aspect of public and private life in the USA. See this video. Listen, I baptized some people from Washington Devil's City. They happened to be very close to the president. They said, Pastor, this president is not suffering dementia and, and, and he's not in a geritol stage. He is possessed with the devil. When, when you see him where he can't speak properly and can't pronounce words, we laugh at that. But we are actually invaded from hell itself mm -hmm. in the executive branch of the United States of America. Oh, yeah. We're in spiritual warfare. The past 24 months has been a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. We have been invaded from hell itself to destroy the greatest nation on earth. And where did they start? They started with the churches. Let's close the churches. Let's silence the voices of the prophets. And, and, and it should be in the United States of America, the prophet, the priests, the prince, and the people. Isaiah talks about that. There is a divine order. God says, I want to speak to my prophet. He's going to speak to my priests. And then the princes, that's governing bodies. And then the people. Well, today, everything is upside down. You have the people controlling the government, the government controlling the priests who have silenced the prophets. America's in trouble today. America's in trouble with God. It's supposed to be the prophet, then the priests, then the government, then the people. Now some better news. USA church attendance fell below 50% for the first time in eight decades, a recent poll by Gallup revealed. In 2020, just 47% of U.S. citizens stated they belonged to a church, synagogue, or mosque. This is a significant decrease, as in 1999, the numbers were up to 70%. Passengers' mixed reactions were captured on video as Christian singers sang gospel music 30,000 feet in the air sparking debates about the nature of worship online. The plane, which is thought to have been on its way to Germany, was taken over by Mr. Jack Jens, who describes himself as the founder of religious organization Kingdom Realm Ministries, based in Philadelphia. We are taking this flight over for Jesus, he says. See this video. My Free Thought Hour guest this week is fellow YouTube channel host, Jeff Dazenbrock. I've never met Jeff before, so anything could happen. It will be starting live in a few minutes, so stay tuned to this channel. And don't forget, we now have a spin-off show, Global Atheist News Review, on Sundays with a panel of opinionated people. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news report next week. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, and set the notifications. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.